All right. Well, welcome everyone. We're really excited to be here. We are, um, I'm Erin Mears. And I'm Julie Bardalis. And uh, we're presenting on dating disclosure and discrimination for pause people. Do you want to introduce yourself first? Alrighty. So um, again, I'm Julie Bardalis. I am the consumer advocate here at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Um, I've changed hair color since this <laughs> picture has been taken, but that's pretty normal for me. I have three children. They're actually really basically pretty grown up, 25, 18, and 16. And if you know me, anything avocado, pineapple, or sloth related are my favorite things. And I use pronouns she, hers, and hers. And I'm um, Dr. Erin Mears. I'm the clinical psychologist for Dartmouth Hitchcock's HIV program. And while Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center is based in Lebanon, I actually go all over the state um, for, uh, to make sure that we have good care for our patients. I'm the mother of two small children. One is turning three and will be three by the time you guys watch this. And uh, the other one is six. I have not actually changed my hair, although it looks orange right now. So oh, it does. I'll go. <laughs> um, since uh, uh, the lockdown, the shutdown, since we're all trying to stay, social distancing, since we're all trying to stay back. Um, and I'm um, a master of poorly timed decisions. I definitely got a puppy while my child was still two years old. And that's definitely a picture of my puppy licking my baby's mouth. In that. <laughs> um, and uh, I love knitting and reading. That's really the way I deal with my stress. And my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, we do have, you can see in the corner, a little explanation point that is our trigger warning. Um, there's nothing trigger warning here in this specific slide, but as we go through, you might see it on the bottom and just, um, if you're, if you're um, feeling a little bit tender or distressed, um, just be aware that we might hit on some things that might be even more triggering for you. So we just wanted to put that there and um, give people a heads up. Um, I mean, I think it, we're going to be talking about sex, we're going to be talking about STIs, and so, I mean, that can be triggering for people mm -hmm. in general, but we just wanted to say that sometimes Absolutely. things might come up. All right, do you want to start us off on Let's our start goals? Us off some, some goals here. So, uh, what we want everyone to be able to do is know what it's like for people living with HIV to navigate obstacles of dating, disclosing, disclosing, excuse me, and discrimination. And when we're talking about discrimination, we're thinking about both internal and external discrimination. And stigma, and we're gonna talk about that in the next slide, actually. Exactly. Um, also help um, people living with HIV identify when to disclose and how to go about disclosing, as well as uh, recognizing internalized discrimination around sexual health and HIV, and be able to talk to people living with HIV, again, about internalized and externalized discrimination around sexual health and HIV as well. Um, and so we wanted to have some definitions um, because we want to make sure that we're being really clear about what we're talking about and that we're all on the same page. So we did label this D3 for the three Ds that we're gonna be talking about. Um, dating, we were thinking about as engaging in an interactive experience, um, with a person that you are attracted to. I added an extra you into the oh, <laughs> nice. so that's exciting. Um, and then disclosure is just sharing your sexual health information. Um, typically, I think disclosure is connected with um, HIV in our context, or at mm -hmm. least in the way that I think about it. Um, but it can really, I mean, if we think about it, it can really be any kind of sexual health information. Oh, absolutely, because we think, I mean, disclosure, not only disclosure with um, maybe a potential partner, but mm -hmm. or Family a family member, yeah. a dentist, um, any of your healthcare yeah. providers that may not be your healthcare provider for your HIV. Right. You know, and can, things get pretty crazy, and sometimes you can end up disclosing to people that you never thought you would even right. fathom yep. disclosing to. Um, and then discrimination um, defined by unjust and prejudicial behaviors based on an attribute being perceived as negative. And so we're gonna be talking that about um, that uh, specifically in the context of HIV. And we're using that instead of externalized stigma, specifically because if people are reacting to the diagnosis of HIV, then it's probably discrimination and not stigma. Stigma being, and I should have put this on here and I apologize that I didn't, but stigma being that internal thought, that internal negative perception and it's when you act on that, whether that's internalized behaviors, like changing your behaviors or making certain choices because of that stigma, 
or someone else acting towards that person, um, that um, that's that's what um, becomes the discrimination piece. So acting on that stigma. Um, we do have a challenge question. That is my email address on there. Um, our email addresses are at the end. So if you want to send it to Julie too, you totally could, but she would get it through me. Um, <laughs> is what's a better word than disclosure? And um, we want people to be thinking about that because disclosure often has a negative connotation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, usually people think when they're disclosing, they're just, it, it's an automatic negative thing, especially for me, you know. So um, if you have any thoughts about what that is, you can definitely put it in the chat or you can email me or both. Um, and uh, give us your ideas. We've already heard sharing, so think of something different. <laughs> All right, uh, because you're at the Ryan, the Ryan White Conference, excuse me, um, we're assuming that you probably are familiar with U equals U. We're gonna just talk about it really briefly though. Did you wanna? Oh, sure, I can it? touch on that a little bit. So um, again, since we know just about anybody is able to come to the Ryan White Conference now, which is wonderful exciting. and yeah. really exciting. So it may not be people who are really have been in the realm That's of true. the HIV world. So a little bit about U equals U, it is undetectable equals untransmittable. And that actually means, has to do with your viral load. If your viral load happens to be below 200, um, the research and the CDC have supported this, that means you are undetectable. And your viral load is how many copies of the virus are floating around inside and your body. You. Yeah. Oh, wait, well, that, <laughs> forget that part. People might not know either. Um, by disclosing, it not only keeps your potential partner in the know, but it also opens up the door to the discussion regarding their statuses as well. That's something actually that I've used um, quite a bit as my own self, because I'll talk a little bit more later about um, stories from Julie, but, um, just uh, so everybody knows, it's helpful to know that I'm actually HIV positive. I was diagnosed back in 2007. So for me, we'll touch on a lot of things that um, I've actually gone through and working with someone like Erin, who happens to be our psychologist for our program, it's made things really work very well. And we've learned quite a bit since we've been working together. Yeah, from each other. Yeah, mm -hmm, from yeah. each other. <laughs> So some tests for viral load, again, how many copies are of the virus are inside your body, um, can be as sensitive. Our previous test, not the one we're using right mm -hmm. now, but our previous test tested as few as 20 copies. Our current test uh, does as many as 40. 40. Mm -hmm. But so even if you come up as detectable on like our test that we're currently using, that doesn't mean that you're not undetectable. Because again, think about that 200. So as long as you're 200 or below, you're still undetectable, which is pretty amazing. And I was just on the phone with someone last week who their test came up that they were detectable and they were they were stressing out about mm -hmm. it. And so I was able to talk with them about this. So, so even people who are aware of U equals U sometimes forget that little piece. So I always wanna put that in mm -hmm. there. Um, and then, um, oh, that was the next, that was the next bullet so we'll just move on so do you want to speak a little bit about what learning about you equal you was like for you oh sure i mean so since i was diagnosed in 2007 which really wasn't that long ago anymore in mm -hmm. the hiv world yeah. and the realm of the world but you know when i was diagnosed you equals you hadn't come about yet so for me um i was single when I was diagnosed, I didn't have a partner. So that was like a really big deal. My biggest fear of um, meeting somebody in the dating world or you know, having a relationship again was having to disclose that I was HIV positive. I was There's really- that word again. That, yes, bum, bum, bum. yes, see, it's the word. You know, my biggest thing was because I had been sexually, um, excuse me, I couldn't even think that rough just now. Um, I, was infected um, by having sex um, with someone. And I honestly still have never figured out who that person was and not to blame, but I realized for me, I never wanted to harm anybody. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how I thought about it was that, you know, if I was positive by being with someone, I had the opportunity to harm them or have them end up having HIV long story short, is it was really tough. I dated, you know, I had relationships, but um, there was always that little piece in the back of my mind, you know, anytime sex came up, 
you know, even though I had told people, yeah. even though I had disclosed, yeah. um, I always had that worry in the back of my mind that I could never be totally comfortable or totally into things because what if? What if that condom would break? Right. What if in the heat of the moment you didn't wear protection? You know, so many different things. So for me to find this out, like maybe two years ago, you know, this had been the thing that maybe one day you would equal you, you know, to actually have that happen was a massive, massive um, change in how I felt with relationships. You know, I happened to be okay with the fact that I was HIV positive. I was okay with disclosing with people. I was okay talking about it. But that relationship piece for me was a massive difference, knowing that I wouldn't infect my partner or whomever because I was undetectable. Yeah. So yeah, it was a massive like load off my mind stress wise. And to be able to share that with other people, other pause people um, has been amazing because it really, really makes a big difference. It's totally one of my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we have a great I time love, talking about it. I love telling people that. I'm like, wait a second, do you know about this? Like, and they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, you equals you. And, and then they're like, oh yeah, the nurse already told me. I'm like, I'm glad they did, but dang it, I love it. Yes. Like, I love talking about it. But um, yeah, I think it's been a game changer game changer for a lot of mm -hmm. people living with HIV to feel that they're not going to harm someone else. Mm -hmm. That comes up a lot in my work too. So um, that's why we have Zoolander because yes. it's that magical moment of learning about you equals you. And yeah, that, no, it's that, amazing. Yeah. It is. It is. Every time we get to share that with like somebody. I feel scoot over. I feel oh. like I'm losing you in this <laughs> All right, so we wanted to, before we get any further into our conversation about um, dating and disclosure and discrimination, we wanted to talk about values. We project our values onto other people. And so if Julie did something that um, was completely unexpected to me, I might feel like, oh, why would she behave in that way? But she's probably behaving according to her own values mm -hmm. and what's important to her and not according to my values. And then that creates discomfort. And I'm like, who are you? What, what, <laughs> you know, because I was assuming that she followed my values. So we're gonna do a values exercise next. Um, so grab a piece of uh, paper and a pen and pick one of your values and define it. Um, and, and think about how, it, um, how that value impacts your work. So I'm gonna pick um, transparency. Do you wanna go with honesty? Yes. If you want to tell us what honesty means to you, and I'll tell you what transparency means to me, and we can kind of talk about how that impacts our work. Beautiful. All right. So for me, when I think about honesty, it's really a big piece. I mean, I think it's a huge piece of like people like telling me the truth, mm -hmm. but I've actually more kind of flipped it. I really, with honesty, I really try to be honest to myself. Mm -hmm. And like, I know if I'm telling myself the truth basically, or being mm -hmm. honest to myself about things, then I can really be much more open to other people because I know I totally can fudge things to my own self. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of those things that like, I used to get really upset with people if they lied to me or mm -hmm. if they weren't truthful or if they stretched the truth. When I realized that, you know, I do those things all the time. <laughs> and you don't even realize it. So for example, you know, honesty for me is one of the things I use for um, being a consumer advocate here is because I do a lot of work with our patients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we try to just, because I'm positive and they're positive, it just that one piece of thing in common that we have just opens it up for us. You know, and Aaron was mentioning before about um, our values portion. And so for me with values and being honest, you know, one of the big things are like our nurses deal with our, our patients taking their medications. And that's a big thing for me. Like mm -hmm. I've always taken my meds. I think in the last 13 years, I've only missed my meds once. And it was because I was in the that's hospital, incredible. which so for me, that's like a huge thing. You know, I had to get over that piece because a part of my job is I help people to remember to take their medications, you know, but one of the things I realized, again, with the honesty piece is I was really honest with myself. And for me, I realized way back when I started taking my antiretrovirals is that one of the things my nurse said to me was, 
once you start taking meds, you're going to take meds forever. If you mm -hmm. take your meds, you'll be undetectable and that's it. So in my mind, that works, you know, and I have to remind myself that it does not work that way for everybody else. Right. All because I feel one way doesn't mean that somebody else feels another way. So the honesty piece for me with HIV related stuff is one of the things is I'm just super open about my status, mm -hmm. you know, with people. And I look at it as me being honest with myself, you know, and I just kind of remember all because honesty is super important for me. It may not be as important for other people or again, with that values piece, everybody sees things differently. Right. And it defines it differently. Yes. That's yeah. huge is, is the definition of it, you know, and how, you know, you feel about things because I think it's, I think what you shared with us was so valuable too, because you talked about how you get mad when other people lie to you or, or stretch this truth mm -hmm. and then recognizing ways that can I do the same things, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, um, and I think that that happens a lot, but that implicit social contract, mm -hmm. right. Um, that I was talking about earlier, right? Like if your value is to be honest and you're going to make an effort to not lie to people, then you're holding other people to that expectation too, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily their value. Maybe it is, exactly. but maybe it's not right. So that's a little bit tricky. Um, transparency for me um, means being genuine to myself and who I am and with my patients. So um, one of the very easy ways for me to explain this in like a really kind of shortened way um, is that when I'm talking with patients around confidentiality and, um, you know, times that I have to break confidentiality, that might be, you know, well, it is like child abuse, elder abuse, um, harm to someone else or harm to yourself. And um, one of the things I say to them is like, if I'm concerned about any of these things, I'm just going to be straight with you and I'm going to tell you and we're going to have a conversation about it and we're going to make a plan together. You might not like the plan. You might not want to agree to the plan, um, but I have to follow these rules by law. And so however I personally feel about it, I still have to take these steps you know, but we can talk about all of those things. So that's the way that I think about transparency in my work. And, um, and part of that is, again, like being genuine. So if I want, if, if someone felt like, like my kids were in danger and that they need to call Child Protective Services, we call them DCYF up here, um, that we would, um, that they would say that to me, that they wouldn't, um, and, and sometimes, honestly, like you have to go confer with someone and then they're like, no, I think that this, like you do need to call. I get it. I get it. I've been in those situations. Um, I've worked with children previously and, um, but I've still called people and been like, hey, this is what's happening. I want you to know so that it's not catching you unawares. Um, it doesn't always work in every situation. It's not always helpful, but that's how I think about it in my work. So um, when we're thinking about disclosure, um, and someone's talking to me about not wanting to disclose the transparency pieces. What do you think are the potential consequences of that? You know, what might be the helpful parts of not disclosing? And we'll talk about that later, but, and then what might be some of the problematic things and really just being honest with them about that is that I hear that this is the road you want to take. I respect this is your life and you're living your life. Let's talk about, let's explore those things. So again, that's, um, one of the privileges that I have of being a psychologist is that we're more talking the exploring and thinking about things like that. Let's talk about discrimination, specifically how it impacts people living with HIV. Um, I don't know if you want to start or if you want to do one part and I want to do the other. Either like, way. I know we're, so I know we're super flexible. <laughs> Gets us into trouble. Um, Let's see. Do you want me to start and then you can talk about that or actually why don't you take how it impacts okay and then yeah, i can I'll talk about how we impact. all right so discrimination how does that impact people living with hiv so um what we've noticed um as an advocate and a psychologist for this program is that um, discrimination makes people less likely to engage in their care specifically for us in their health care mm -hmm. around their hiv um, it also um, can lead to your own internalized stigma, kind of like this judging of your own self. Right. You know, nobody judging you per se, but you judging yourself. I would even argue that it's because 
of the culture that we already have, mm -hmm. the stigma that's already around true. HIV, Very that true. that leads to the internalized stigma. Because what I see is that um, people, newly diagnosed individuals, right? Mm -hmm. um, so these are people who are coming into HIV without necessarily a lot of education around it, mm -hmm. although sometimes they do have education around it. Um, start feeling a certain way towards themselves. And that can be feeling contaminated, feeling, oh, yes. you know. Um, so so I think that that it is yeah, no, not you're... necessarily like a specific person, but kind of this overall idea no, you're of right. what we think about. That like hub, because I mm -hmm. even myself, you know, we've discussed this before. Yeah. I forget. I mean, I don't think it's been that long, but even 13 years, I can rewind and realize, you know, and remember when I was first diagnosed in yeah. that whole piece that we have on this list, this like sense of rejection, sense of contamination, and that harm to your mental health. Yeah. I mean, I know at first I was diagnosed and I thought, wow, you know, you, you get that diagnosis. And for me, I thought, okay, you know, I think I can handle this. But in reality, I was a single mom with three young children at the time. And I didn't realize until I was home with the kids of that own, you know, internalized stigma. I stopped sharing drinks with the kids. Mm -hmm. I didn't let anybody, I mean, I let them hug me and stuff, but you know, my kids would jump up and give me a quick kiss on the mouth. I was, I wasn't doing that anymore. I wasn't sharing, you know, my fork. I wasn't feeding them off my plate. And these were all things that I knew already that my children weren't going to get HIV from right. sharing a drink with me, food with me, using the same bathroom as me. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to scrub down my bathroom constantly because I would, you know, shaving your legs in the shower. Well, out of nowhere here, this was making me crazy and I needed to scrub everything down with bleach every day, you know, and now I look at that and think that's just absolutely insane, right? But I think about it being insane just because you're not doing that. I don't clean anything else. I don't day. know. I was going crazy. Sorry, no, no, it's true. It's true. <laughs> right. But for about a month, yeah. I really definitely was really, really yeah. hard on myself right. and was terrified. Yeah. You know. And I just want to say, I mean, Julie said that this is um we've seen this in our own work, mm -hmm. but this these are also based on research. And I do have references that um I will be sharing. Um and I apologize that I didn't specifically cite the references to the pages. But if you ever have any questions about where where I got the information, you guys can definitely um send me an email or ask in the chat. Um, but uh, we know from research as well that these are all things that people living with HIV experience across um, the world. Um, so uh, I just want to speak to how we enact it, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Oh, um, absolutely. So feeling pressure to disclose um, the diagnosis or, you know, um, I've even seen some people use it as a way to kind of test others, you know, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to disclose my, um, HIV and see if they're going to stay because if they don't, then I know they're a jerk. That might be true, <laughs> but is that necessarily, do you need to disclose? And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, judgmental comments around behaviors that can be um, coming externally or even again, internally, um, those comments. Uh, bodily reaction. So this is kind of more um, externally, again, in the social services, if someone's sitting down and trusting you enough to um, talk about disclosure and explore that with you, there might be, you know, if they're saying, I don't ever want to disclose, I don't want to tell anyone, you might notice your own, or you might not notice, but your body might be tensing around that, and you might be making a face, my eyebrows, woo, go up, right, or I might be like, ooh, why are you, why are you doing that, right, so we got to be aware of those things, and our own reactions, and again, that's where it comes, our values come into it, being aware of our values, and how we might feel about this, um, and then um, kind of that more explicit, very obvious um, changing behavior in a negative, derogatory, or harmful way, um, intentionally trying to harm someone. Um, so just beginning to be aware of those things. Um, even flippant comments around um, HIV or the diagnosis or things like that can be harmful um, and discriminatory. Um, and then we have internalized um, stigma. Oops. Sorry, let me go back. Um, internalized stigma being uh, defined as negative attitudes, views, thoughts, um, and the like towards oneself perpetuated by the external environment. And that's what I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier about where even just 
this kind of haze around um, the, the HIV stigma in our culture, how that perpetuates the internalized stigma. Mm -hmm. When people are first diagnosed in our program, um, they sit down with the nurse and we try to bring in other members of the team who are relevant, who are available immediately. And, um, and so we try to, you know, envelop them in comfort and um, reassurance but there's so much internalized stigma that's already being played out. Um, and I see it so frequently, mm -hmm. even, um, you know, in people who are very well educated around the um, diagnosis, it's just, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I just, I had found um, some research, like I mentioned before, that talks about how um, in order for someone to even experience stigma, whether that's internalized or externalized, mm -hmm. that there has to, something has to be stigmatized. And right. again, we're talking about stigmatizes those negative attitudes, thoughts um, that are, that are kind of floating around, whatever it is. And so just some examples around um, stigmatized behaviors around HIV, anal sex, sexual orientation, and IV substance use. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think actually even to speak to what you had said earlier about that you haven't figured out how, you know, like what, how it happened and when oh, it exactly. happened or who, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that there's this piece of like, I have to figure this out. I have to, I have to, oh, know, absolutely. you know, and, um, and I've, I've spoken with other people around that too, that that mm -hmm. comes up for them. There's like this missing piece and it's almost like, if I could just figure this out, then I would feel differently or I'd feel better. And the truth is typically it doesn't change anything. No. Um, but, uh, I think that there's kind of this idea around that. But um, going back to these stigmatized behaviors, I think that um, anal sex is extremely stigmatized. And I think mm -hmm. it's because of its relationship to the gay community um, when it's not, it's not exclusive to the gay community. I mean, no. people are just yeah. lying to themselves. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've had, um, you know, when I've disclosed to um, a potential partner before, I've had um, a gentleman look at me and say, but you're a woman, you know, just blown away that I was a woman that could have HIV because it wasn't something that women got, you know? So yeah, even that in itself, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I'd be like, let's lay down some statistics right now. <laughs> we know that the majority of people living with HIV in the world. Right? Yep. Um, so, but, um, and then IV substance use, substance use already is, um, stigmatized in mm -hmm. general um and and not necessarily alcohol but when we think about um opioid use um methamphetamine use again which is often linked with the gay community um and i think even the campaigns to um discourage people from substance use right like this is your brain this is your brain on drugs um or uh harmful things um like how methamphetamine infects uh, impacts your mouth right? Um, those, those strategies are used to discourage people from using, and then it actually creates stigma as well. Yeah. Because, um, you know, if this is your brain on drugs, then people who use drugs don't have a working brain, or it's ineffectual, right? Like, that's so harmful. Um, yeah. it, it Obviously, drugs impact our brains. We know that. But um, yeah, so, so that creates that, that same thing. Um, and then, the last piece of stigma being based on negative stereotypes. And then when we internalize those, we end up stigmatizing ourselves. And, um, and we can, that can result in self-discriminating behavior, which is what I was talking mm -hmm. about earlier, of Absolutely. making certain choices um, or even perceiving others um, in a way that's, uh, you know, assuming that they're, they're judging or feeling negative towards you and being aware of um, that maybe they are, maybe they're not, um, but that that can have an impact, so. All right, more on um, internalized stigma. Um, so I, these are some questions that we came up with um, around so to kind of get you guys thinking about internalized stigma and mm -hmm. how it plays out with people living with HIV, did you want to, I feel like I talked a whole slide. Oh no, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. Um, let's see. So for example, you know, Aaron and I were talking about things like this because one of the things in the past, you know, before U equals U came up is I personally felt like I was obligated, exactly what we have on here, you know, that word obligated to tell every single potential partner 
that I had that I was HIV positive. You know, I thought like by law, I needed to disclose because then nobody could come back later and say, but you didn't tell me kind of thing. You know, so for example, though, Aaron and I spoke about this when we were putting all of this together. And this is a question that she brought up to me, which made total sense, like total sense. I got to watch her brain. Explode. My brain exploded, basically. <laughs> you know, and she said, would you feel obligated to tell a partner that you previously contracted syphilis and then subsequently, I can't even read, <laughs> subsequently treated it and were not effectively cured? The I and, can't speak. And were effectively cured. I don't know why I got not in there. No, it's okay. But, but um, again, that yeah. was huge for me. And I thought, you know, she's right. Like, what about um, chlamydia? Right? I mean, same thing. Right. You have chlamydia. Yeah. You take some pills. Poof, it's gone. Right. You're like, do, did would I feel like I need to sit down and list that? I mean, you know? when I, you know, if I was going to go to a hookup, I wouldn't be like, wait a second, here's my list. Here's of all my list. list. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, we just don't, it, it just would, what's the point? If it's already treated and cured, like in the case of the syphilis question, yeah. Um, like what, what would even be the point yeah, of I mean, bringing it up? It, there is no point because exactly. you're not putting them at risk. And that's one of the things that comes up a lot. Like you're not putting people at risk. If you're undetectable under 200, exactly. you're not putting people at risk. Um, and then I think that um, people are like, well, STI, like syphilis is curable, HIV is not. So then the idea of like herpes, right? Mm -hmm. Herpes is not curable, um, but you can take medication and you can still have an outbreak, at which point it is still putting people at risk exactly. for um, um, contracting herpes. And, and so if you're not, having an outbreak you're on your medication for herpes would you feel obligated i think that i think and i don't know what your idea is and again you guys can add your opinions mm -hmm. in the chat that hiv because of the stigma associated with it it's weightier right you might be like yeah but yeah. this is hiv that we're talking about yeah it's an sti and it's treatable right like and i'm not mm -hmm. trying to be disrespectful but like that idea that wait a second, we need to treat this differently. That's the stigma, right? And again, it comes from HIV's very intense past, right? It was really, really scary in the 80s and the 90s. We're mm -hmm. not trying to min minimize that at all. It's just, it's a different situation now. And that, that past hangs over today. Absolutely. And we're absolutely impacted around it. Absolutely. Um, and, and so I listed some things um, that I've seen in my work, and, and I believe that you've seen some of these things, maybe oh, not yeah. all of them, but um, some of them. Absolutely. I was telling Julie that I was watching Pose, um, and there's a scene where one of the characters was diagnosed, and um, he says, you know, like, I'm going to die, and he's crying, and um, Billy Porter's character, pray tell, hugs him, and and comforts him and I'm like crying and my partner's like what's wrong and I'm like it's too real right now because I just had a patient like earlier that week who had said the exact same thing to me and um didn't want to be hugged because they felt like they were mm -hmm. contagious and I was like listen I'm gonna hug you anyway because you're not contagious you're a human and um and so I had to take a break from watching those for a little bit because I was so crying. <laughs> I know and I think that's so, why I haven't really watched it yet because I'm afraid it's it's going to be too too real for me and and I know it sounds yeah. crazy but I, I love it it's you know, even if definitely... it makes me cry um but we have some um we have some case studies that we want to bring up um I feel like it's helpful um to kind of conceptualize these um do you want me to take the mail and you can take the female either way oh. whatever works I can't remember where we got the female from, but I know who the male is, so. Yes, go ahead. You can see we've got our trigger warning in the bottom as we're <laughs> checking this out, so I apologize. It's taking us a minute. Um, so case one is a 21-year-old male, um, MSM, identifies as black, um, is, is black, um, and um, was recently diagnosed. Um, so within about, I think, two months, um, mm -hmm. this conversation is happening, um, reports feeling pressure to disclose to current partner by one of the members of his care team, which is part of our team, 
Um, I'm not necessarily convinced that that person was trying to pressure them to disclose, mm -hmm. but that was his perception. And that's what's important to me. Um, reports wanting to have a family and wanting to be closer to his family. So, um, so there's kind of this mix, like, should I disclose? Is that going to make me feel closer? It makes me feel like I'm hiding something if I don't. But also there's this huge part of him that never wants anyone else to know. Um, so one of the first things that we addressed is could he ever have a family? Um, and we talked about absolutely he can have a family. Mm -hmm. That's not, doesn't, nothing's going to stop him from that. Um, and uh, we explored um, that desire to be closer to his family and, um, and talked about how he, um, you know, what, what, what would change if he disclosed and how would it be helpful and how would it not be helpful? Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that you have a lot of those conversations with, um, our patients. Do you, can you think of anyone who's maybe in a similar situation as this young man who like, um, yes, how I do you mean, kind of break down? Should I mean, you disclose or should yeah, you Yeah. And it's definitely, I think what, um, you know, Aaron's saying is that big piece of, you know, this particular patient never wants anyone to know. And, you know, for me and with my values, it, I feel one way about things of, you know, I happen to be, when I was diagnosed, very open with my family, my immediate family. And, you know, um, but one of the things that I realized even, you know, you never know how someone's going to react. So that's a big piece that mm -hmm. I've learned over the years of, you know, my comfort level with things doesn't mean that someone else has a comfort level right. that I do with your diagnosis, which I always remind people, and it's a big thing when I disclose, is that's mine. Mm -hmm. If I disclose and I tell someone my status, that is mine. I own it. You don't own it. You don't get to share that without my permission. So that's a big piece. Like for me, you know, I understand with, um, with this young man that he doesn't want people to know, which is his choice, you know, and he may in the future need to let maybe a partner know or, but maybe not. Right. You know, that's that big thing. Like in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, your partner needs to know, your partner needs to know. But honestly, I happen to have the same partner for the last three years. So this partner I disclosed to when we first met and, you know, went over everything and was privy to my being positive. And then U equals U came about. So I had that experience with like the one same partner of, you know, going from one realm to the other realm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, what it's like for, you know, our, our patient who's 21. I mean, I get it. If he doesn't want anybody to know, I really feel that that's his prerogative, especially like with my experience of you never right. know how other people are going to react and you don't know. Yeah. And I, you know, even with like my children who have, I've told for years, you know, I need you to talk to me before you tell your friends and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. or be prepared to, right. I don't want to say suffer the consequences, but you know, my oldest daughter has many times shared my status with people and it's kind of come back to bite her in the patootie, mm -hmm. you know, because. Because of stigma? Because of stigma. And yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Does I, that help? Does... Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, one of the things that I said to him, and again, you guys can feel free to share your opinions, um, but um, was that if he doesn't ever want anyone to know, he doesn't have to. Um, and that, I mean, his healthcare team knows, and we want to continue to take care of him and support him in being undetectable. Um, but that if he doesn't want to share it, that he doesn't have to. Yeah. Um, I've, I've said that to multiple of our patients and, um, I find that they usually find someone that they can trust. And then, you know, I think that it's a, it's a process, you know, like, growing into that as part of your identity, you mm -hmm. know, and, and Julie has done that beautifully. Um, and, and yeah. that some people are just not able to move to that place and that there's nothing wrong with that. Again, like that might not be how I would want to live my life, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong just because it's different than what mm -hmm. I would want. So, um, so I think that that's good. 
Um, our second case is a 46 year old female. Um, she has sex with men and um, she was diagnosed in the early 90s, currently in a long term monogamous relationship. Uh, she wants to be honest with her partner and she has been undetectable for years, um, but is scared to disclose. She feels like her relationship's really good mm -hmm. and um, and it's finally gotten to a point. It was, it was, <clears throat> excuse me. It was a little bit, um, she was a little bit worried that the relationship was going to end. So, um, she says that she always waits to see if the relationship is going to be long-term. And then she, um, once it becomes like solid, then she'll disclose, but it was a little bit rocky and now she's feeling like it's solid, but now she's also four years into it. So what would you, what would be your amazing advice? Oh. <laughs> okay, so just because I've I've been in this particular yeah. um I've I've been there, you yeah. know, the first long-term relationship I had after I was diagnosed, I chose I, I didn't tell my partner. You know, um we were together for a little bit over two years. We actually lived together. Um she is part-time living with this. Okay, so yes, see, so this actually makes total sense. And look, I'm 46 right now, but this was this was a while back. But um, basically, you know, for me, I look at it's never too late to disclose. We'll talk um, about that later. And we'll yes, we will touch on that later. But you know, it's tough. It's tough um, on your own self. Um, that whole disclosing after the fact, I found it very difficult because, um, you know, at the time, U equals U didn't exist, but in my mind, I was like, you know what, I'm taking my medication, I'm undetectable, and I'm always using protection, you know, so that's how I mentally dealt with it, but to be honest, it still was a, a mind bleep, like I still wasn't, because you know what ended up happening a couple of times, we had a condom break, and I was living with the stress of mm. that. And when I did disclose, um, the partner I had actually was really amazing with me disclosing. And, you know, he said that he had thought that I thought that he must have had some type of STI since I was always so insistent on using protection. But, you know, with that disclosure, you know, I was like, you know, the condom broke a couple times, I'm undetectable, the the likelihood of you ending up positive is so very bare, minimal and slim, but I still feel that you should be tested. Mm -hmm. You know, so we went through that, um, that experience, which may be a good story for now, may not of um, him getting tested, but um, I don't, I don't no, he had, yeah, no, he had, um, he had a false positive so from a rapid test. So, um, this was my big learning experience. You know, he just had the mouth swab, which at the time, you know, this is going back, gosh, maybe 11 years now. I mean, we just, so I remember when I first started here, yeah, we were still doing or do, the or mouth swabs. swabs. And, um, you know, then of course they followed this with um, the, a true um, blood test, which takes, at that time took, I don't even know, a week or two to get oh. results or 10 days. So he got this, positive result, you know, which was still not a hundred percent sure positive result. Mm -hmm. And watching the um, mental anguish and pain he went through during this time of waiting for the other tests to come back was total torture um, I, for him, but for myself. Mm -hmm. I will never forgive myself. I have now, but at that time, I was like, I will never, ever, ever not tell someone again. So, you know, this, this is how things work for me. Of course, things have changed. It's U equals U now. And this gentleman ended up being negative. You know, right. he, he ended up not having a positive diagnosis. But um, for me, that was a huge learning experience. Like the stress on my own self, right. I never wanted to go through that stress again. Right. Do people have to disclose? No. You don't, you really don't. But um, for me, it's, it's, that's how my brain works. So for our, our female case two, you know, I know she wants to be honest with her partner and it mentally for her, you know, it may make life easier for her in mm -hmm. her head yeah. to, um, to talk to her partner yeah. about it.
you know? I didn't mention that um, she's been undetectable for years um, at this point, too. I don't think I was able to fit it in there. Oh, I yeah, but I didn't put it in there. But I think the other thing mm -hmm. is that um, for her, she has multiple health problems. So she takes a lot of medication. And um, so she's not even sure just how to even bring it up in the conversation. Oh, it's so that like, was one of the things that, like, because oh, it's just yeah. such a non issue, right? She goes, I think she's like um, once a year, right? Oh, yeah. And exactly. so she goes to her ID doctor um, once a year and she, um, like, her, her HIV is so well controlled that it's an afterthought. But she, again, feels mm -hmm. this like weight on her heart that exactly. she needs to share. So we, um, one of the things that we talked about was um, AIDS 2020 conference and the release of the Sao Paulo patient mm -hmm. and like how bringing that up can be this segue into yeah. talking about it. And that was really helpful and exciting. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. yeah she was also really excited about a medication only cure. So we talked about that a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, so we're going to move into talking about this closing. Um, and kind of more breaking down some strategies around how do we even do this mm -hmm. and, and how we talk about it with the people that we work with. Um, so intimate conversations kind of more like with those interpersonal partners. Um, and I have, again, one of my other, I think I just need a book of isms. No, you this do. But I say all the time. Uh, Erinisms. So, <laughs> exactly. Uh, when, when is the best time to just close? Just really fast. Um, I want to have Julie answer this question, but I'm just going to explain that full bellies make for calm conversations. You're, when you're digesting food, it's actually harder for your body to become reactive and become anxious because your belly is so full of food. Um, so I'm always encouraging people to have conversations um, while you're eating dinner definitely like give it a few minutes to, for food to start getting into your belly but like during that time when you're eating dinner or right after dinner don't wait too long but those full belly moments are really good mm -hmm. for those calm conversations scientifically proven so I'm going to embroider this and hang it in my office no you I should most say. definitely I was like oh there's a reason I love to eat <laughs> it keeps me calm <laughs> All right, but what are some of your, like, when are good times to disclose? What do you think besides while we're eating? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I think, I think eating's a good time. I mean, definitely <laughs> I mean, food time is good time, but, um, you know, probably, I mean, I've had times that I've disclosed just, just like, poof, out of nowhere, <laughs> oops, this was the best time, but I think just, you know, when, when there's time to talk, mm. I mean, I've noticed, you know, it's ends up being a really, for me anyways, it, it has ended up being like a really long conversation. Right. You know, and I think it just depends on. I think when it's a genuine person who wants to genuinely have a relationship with you, then those tend to yeah. be longer conversations. Because if they're not prepared to become, and I'm going to say that level of intimate with you, mm -hmm. right? Because sex isn't always intimate. Um, action. It's right. getting to know someone and <clears throat> developing that relationship, that emotional connection that's more intimate. Um, if people aren't ready to make that level of commitment, then they're not necessarily going to stay and have those long conversations. Exactly. So it could end up being a super short conversation, which right. I know as we discussed, you have um, someone that is, um, that's how they, they rule people out. Right. That's right? what I mentioned before. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. So. And what about how do I do disclose what are some things that I could say so or some ways better than others I'm going to recommend the person that I mentioned mm -hmm. who um, works in an industrial setting and sometimes gets like cuts or whatever um, was like kind of just being like everyone stay back <laughs> and I was just like oh no oh no that's no that's not the best way yeah no it is like let's see so like for me, and I was thinking of your case too just now, who has a lot of other medical yeah. things that are going on. Like I've always, um, my HIV story, I've kind of segued from my, my cancer story, you know, and that's how I've kind of piggybacked one on the other. Yeah. Just FYI, Julie is a cancer survivor. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. because yeah, I mean, I won't go into my whole story right now because I don't remember if, if we have a spot for that at some point, but you know, that's how I've told my story because 
almost nine times out of 10, I've had the discussion of, you know, like I, cause I've got tons of abdominal scars and I've had multiple surgeries. Um, but I happened to have colon cancer 13 years ago. And within having colon cancer, having a massive resection done um, within, you know, two or three months from getting through healing from my um, big surgery, I was then poof diagnosed with HIV. So this all happened within like a matter of like three months. So for me, when I tell my story, it's like I start off with like my cancer story and everything. And then I'm kind of like, Oh, and by the way, <laughs> you know, I just kind of slide it in there. So people hear me, but it's, you know, as Aaron was saying earlier, it's not that we want to diminish HIV and say it's not a big deal. Right. But with the medications and with what's happened and all of the things that they found and I mean, with the medications, you know, and that we are undetectable and we're healthier because of it and we're able to take one pill a day as, instead of 20. I mean, I can't fathom, you know, how that right. was for people or is still for people because there are still people that right. they have That's to take the cocktail. The yeah. cocktail and you know how that makes them feel and they don't feel well and right. makes them sick or makes them nauseous or gives them diarrhea. But long story short is like for me that's how I've disclosed. I've kind of just Right. Piggybacked it on my right. my story of my health. Well, and I think that it doesn't I think that it works to diminish the stigma around it. I don't mm -hmm. think it diminishes the HIV, right? Yes. And I think that treating HIV as a chronic illness that is absolutely treatable and controllable, mm -hmm. right? And in a way that like like we were talking about earlier, herpes doesn't do is right. is not controllable in the same way. That and and, and to be like completely honest, right? Like not everyone's HIV is controllable, right? Mm -hmm. We definitely work with people who can't get undetectable or they can't get their, um, oh my gosh, their CD4 count. Oh yeah, their CD4 count up. Yeah. Right. And, um, and that, that happens too. And that's terrible. And like, we want to help those people get healthy and get what they need. Um, and, and so we want to acknowledge that undetectable isn't something that everyone can attain because it's, mm -hmm. it's not, and that sucks. Right. Um, but what we're seeing is that for the vast majority of people, that undetectable is something that they can obtain mm -hmm. and, um, and that that's, that's a game changer for a lot of people. Um, but so, so it's a chronic, it's a manageable chronic disease mm -hmm. and that's what it is. Right. And exactly it's, it doesn't have to be the monster that it is right right true that we kind of yeah yeah that that so has, many people yeah so with. the last question and this one i think is one of the most important ones is should i disclose is it necessary to disclose what if i feel pressure to disclose and again i'm gonna say as a psychologist you don't have to disclose no it's your choice right absolutely and um, and I think that this is in here somewhere. Um, I know we talked about it, but like the legal aspect. So we won't mm. talk about that right now, but um, there, are, there are external um, pressures that we have um, pushing on us and, and encouraging behaviors in certain ways. And definitely considering those and taking them into account is important and we should do that. But also, I mean, when we think about the, there's those questions listed on the side. How will it make me feel? Is this person a safe person? Are, mm -hmm. Am I even in a safe location? And do they really even need to know my status, right? Because there are absolutely places in the world where sharing your status is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, or sharing your status with a certain person is dangerous. And we don't want people to be put in those kinds of situations. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. I don't know. I mean, definitely that whole piece of, you know, do you, do they really need to know your status? I mean, I think that's huge because in so many instances, people don't need to know your status. Right. They really don't. Right. I mean, you know, like for me, that particular relationship that I had that I didn't disclose originally, I mean, I got into one little sticky situation with that particular person that I ended up getting hurt 
And I chose for my own self not to go to the emergency room because he was going to bring me. And I knew if he was in the room, I had a huge chance of being Just in- Just to be clear, he didn't hurt you, right? He did not hurt me. <laughs> no, I'm a little Just... bit clumsy. And oh my gosh. yeah, I, I have a- That's another story for That's another a, time is, that she traumatized me being clumsy. Oh yeah, totally. But long story short is I chose not to go to the emergency room that time because of the fact that um, m- most likely we would have discussed medications and it, it would have come up. That fear of- um, I was terrified. Just, yeah. Being, oh, I like, was afraid. Like being outed. Right? Oh yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, it, again, that happened to be with a partner, but yeah, do you have to disclose? No, you don't. And the best thing is what Aaron was saying. I mean, how does it make you feel? And, and that's huge. Right. You know, how do you feel about it? Yep. And you should never feel pressured by anybody to have to disclose to anyone. Right. Right. Um, which is why I was so glad that that case one gentleman said to me like that he felt pressure right because real or imagined it doesn't matter that's his perspective we can talk about that and then I can also go to that team member and talk with them about it and um, you know have have a conversation around how can I support you and maybe thinking about this differently or engaging in a different way or maybe exactly. not you know um, so disclosure and family members. So this is a little bit different than with uh, with a person that you're going to become sexually intimate with um, or a long-term partner um, or short-term partner, whatever that case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, do family members need to know? And then what are some benefits to sharing with family members? What are some potential problems mm-hmm. to sharing with family members? Who actually needs to know? And do you feel compelled to tell? And then asking yourself why? I think that a lot of the patients that I think about who are struggling around disclosure and family members often feel compelled to tell. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's why I brought that in. Um, And then this piece about who needs to know, right? Like, so someone who potentially could be a caregiver or be um, an emergency contact, is it important for them to know? Um, I know that our team often goes to great lengths to protect people's statuses. and, And even so, we've still seen in hospital in the hospital setting, um, and not just in our hospital, um, but in other New Hampshire hospitals, that mm-hmm. people's um, diagnoses have been um, disclosed to family members um, without their permission, um, which is such a frustrating experience from yeah, our team side. Really we tough. work so hard to protect um, if they if that's their wishes, um, but um, I can think of one um, young man who. Uh, really felt he, I met with him when he had first been diagnosed and he was, um, he was planning on telling his family, um, but he had just come out as gay to his family and they were really struggling with that. And he had only started to like begin to repair the relationship from that. Um, And uh, which, (laughs) Sorry, I'm having feelings about that. That makes me really upset. But yeah. um, that was the experience that he was going through heartbreakingly. And um, so he, um, I saw him like a year later. Um, so he wasn't going to disclose at the time. And then he, I saw him a year later, um, just a quick check-in during clinic. And I, you know, I asked him how he was doing. And he was saying that he was thinking about disclosing his status to his mom. And we, he felt compelled to. He felt compelled to very strongly. Um, and we, we kind of explored like, what would be the benefit? What would not be, Mm -hmm. what are, what are some barriers or problems that could come up? And ultimately he decided to not tell her because he felt, especially thinking about how she had reacted to, um, his sexual orientation that he just felt like this would break their relationship. And he valued their relationship so strongly, so much. And he just really didn't want to strain that relationship any longer, at least not at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the beautiful thing about choosing to not disclose is that if you want to later, you can, you can always do that later. Exactly. Keep that in your back pocket. Absolutely. Did you have any? Let's see, like, so for me with, um, especially disclosure with family members, because of my diagnosis that I got this, like right after everything that happened with my cancer diagnosis and surgeries and whatnot, I ended up, um, you know, living in Vermont with the kids and I didn't have a partner and my father ended up being like my person 
that um, brought me to all my appointments, you know, brought me to every surgery, brought me for my blood transfusions, you name it, my dad was bringing me there. So when I found out about my HIV, you know, I just immediately told him, which in turn, you know, his, his wife um, was immediately told and, you know, my family members, which, you know, I was okay with. But I've come to learn, you know, all because I'm okay with things and how I react with things um, doesn't mean that your family members, depending on who they are or don't, might not react or feel the same way about them is what I'm trying to say. I do have strong feelings. um, I'm having strong feelings. (laughs) Towards my, um, (laughs) towards my father's wife, who um, even after all these years, has a tendency to bring up not the fact that I'm HIV positive, but the fact that um, I have a compromised immune system. And, you know, when I was first diagnosed, she brought it upon herself to call my children's school and asked to speak to the school nurse and then told the school nurse that I was HIV positive. And in my mind, I'm just kind of, I couldn't figure out, like, I would never do that. Like, that that would just never even occur to me. And I happened to get really lucky, even though I lived in this tiny little Vermont rural town, that the school nurse happened to have been an extremely knowledgeable, educated um, nurse who happened to be an HIV nurse in her previous life which is amazing because we run into nurses now again in our very oh absolutely who don't know anything about hiv oh yeah so so it this was huge for me so i got a phone call from the school from the school nurse letting me know that she got this phone call from my stepmother and she really just wanted to let me know that i i needed to talk to her because in her mind she was being helpful when it was really the not stepmother. helpful, the stepmother, my yes. stepmother thought the nurse was, was actually, helpful. yes, the nurse was helpful, <laughs> but my stepmother didn't think anything of it. You know, she, in her mind, she was being helpful. And, you know, this is something we've struggled with, you know, over the years. And, you know, so that's one of my, my pieces with the family member, you know, would right now, what I still have wanted her to know. Yeah. You know what, because I get upset, but it's, it's not on me, it's on her kind of thing is, is what I try to accept because I get really flaming mad, especially after all these years when it's this constant, you know, be careful, um, be careful with COVID because you're uh, uh, immunocompromised and that sort of thing. So long story short, it's th- that whole piece, you know, who needs to know whoever you want to know. And being thoughtful about that. And I think that Mm -hmm. one of the things that I see is that when people are newly diagnosed, they're just looking for support and sometimes end up disclosing to people who are uneducated, who don't know really, you know, anything about HIV and then potentially are sharing it with others or even like using it in perverse ways such Mm -hmm. as like posting things on Facebook or things like that I've had patients experience all of these things and um and it's private health information I mean like it's I mean I I think that if we we think about a different chronic disease like if I was diagnosed with diabetes I would also absolutely want support from my family Mm -hmm. and I'd be feeling overwhelmed and discouraged and if I went to my family and told them about it and then they're posting it on their Facebook, I'd be like, um, excuse you, that's my private health information, exactly. you know? Um, but I think again, with the stigma, that's the, that kind of, um, oh, I just had a word. The, I can't remember now. It's called <laughs> miasma, the miasma of the, the stigma around HIV creates even more problems around that, right? Mm-hmm. Diabetes is so much less stigmatized. Um, even again, herpes, which has some stigma mm-hmm. attached to it because it's an STI, but is still not as stigmatized as HIV. And still just, I think that um, we want to be thoughtful and careful about that. And that is something we talk about when people are newly diagnosed. And um, I mean, people are people and they're just looking for comfort oh, and support. And so they end up still di- 
just well, yeah, disclosing I, or sharing their status and um that's a huge piece though i think you know because not everybody's a talker uh or i i i am i am <laughs> right here um but you know that is a piece to have somebody to talk to about yeah about your status, about what you just found out, about, or even not just found out, but years later, you know, you just never know. I mean, right. again, with like the family member piece, because I know I have met, you know, other HIV positive people that, you know, have maybe never disclosed to their children or their families or what have you, which yep. is everybody's right. But like, for example, for myself, I had very young children when I was diagnosed. And I chose to tell them when they were quite young. And, you know, people have asked me now, like, how have I gone about that? Like, what did it do for me? You know, I took the chance of telling my kids when they were young, like my oldest daughter at the time, you know, with her maybe sharing that information with her friends and my PHI getting out there. But I used it as a, um, a learning a learning piece with my mm -hmm. children, you know, because I realized for me as when I was younger, you know, sex was a big taboo thing. You know, I was born in the seventies and when I was in high school, my parents were already divorced. We didn't talk about sex. My mother didn't talk about sex, you know, as long as she knew, you know, if you have sex, use a condom, but I know you're not having sex. So I'm not gonna even touch on this. So I ended up using this as a um, platform to educate my children. So when I told them my status and told them I was positive, it was a huge education piece. And that's what I wanted to use it for, you know, mm -hmm. and it worked really well. It was a really, you know, very well received by them. And in turn, even though my oldest daughter really liked to share um, my information, she ended up sharing that with the knowledge of um, use protection. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just because we lived in rural Vermont, we lived in the middle of nowhere out in the country, nobody was walking into the general store to buy a pack of condoms. You know, I just always had condoms on hand. And that was one of the things that I thought was good was the sex education piece that I feel like I had, but I had like this bare minimal sex education mm -hmm. back in the day when I was younger. And I didn't want it to be taboo. And I wanted it to be something that my children could talk to me about, so, which has opened huge doors because not only are we able to talk about sex openly, we're able to talk about drugs, we're able to talk about alcohol, um, you know, relationships, feelings, and it's been an amazing experience for me. And with that, up um, here is a decision chart, actually, that um, Aaron and I came up with to try to help you or people kind of figure out whether or not they need to or really want to disclose to certain people in, um, you know, their, I was going to say family, but it's really in their, their bubble, yeah, right? Their in bubble, their, their circle. Yeah, yep. their circle. Their support Thank you. organization, whatever that means. So um, we should put like tattoo artists on here too. But oh yeah, no, because yeah, that was a big thing. Or yeah. piercer. Um, so, so you can see we have like sibling number one crossed out. And sometimes it's just easier to be like, this person is just not, mm -hmm. not ever going to be someone that I feel comfortable or safe disclosing to. And Absolutely. Just, boop, cross them off the list. Um, case manager at Mental Health Center. That's what MHC is standing for there. Um, you know, I think that I've definitely had, I, I mean, I have the amazing privilege to work. I'm embedded into the um, infectious disease department. I work exclusively with the HIV program. So I have the privilege of working only with people living with HIV. Um, but I've definitely encountered a lot of our patients who are coming um, from external mental health care and um, saying, you know, I brought up my HIV, but my care provider didn't know anything about it, mm -hmm. you know, um, or didn't know how to respond or felt like I needed to disclose or, you know, and so um, that perspective I think can be helpful to kind of again think about that person might be supportive mm -hmm. you know in some aspects but are they going to be educated about it and then as the so often you know the burden of education ends up on the person who's disclosing and um, that can be really hard too so and i've even worked with um, mental health providers around educating them 
um, and dentists actually as well. Yes. So we've had issues with dentists <laughs> here. Um, so uh, yeah, and then a crush, like does a crush need to know? Probably not, that's a mm-hmm. superficial relationship right there. Um, a religious person, again, could be supportive. Do they have the education? Are you going to feel like you mm-hmm. have to now educate them or is it going to harm the relationship? You know, are you feeling judged? So important things to kind of think about. And we were just kind of creating this. It was a super simple Excel. Um, not even, I think it was a Word one or maybe even through PowerPoint. I just know. a really easy super quick. chart to, yeah. to make um, to help kind of give people um, somewhere to start thinking about it. I'm thinking about time and we are running out. Oh, we are running out of time. Okay, we? Um, we have a really quick video um, on this one. So let's watch Kim. I was infected with HIV within my marriage. I said, how long have you known? And he said, I don't know, Kim, over 10 years. Why haven't we talked about this? Why didn't I know? I thought I planned out everything perfectly. I thought we crossed every T and dotted every I. If my husband would have shared with me his status prior to him becoming so sick, we could have really addressed this together. I think it would have showed him that my love for him was so much greater than a test or a disease that lived within his body. I hate that he felt alone. I found strength in breaking the silence and coming out and telling my story because I saw what it looked like as a secret. I didn't want HIV to take over me. If this is the the card that I've been dealt, I want to have a hand in how it plays out. And I want it to play out well. If you just refuse to get tested, can you really say to yourself, have I done everything to be true to me? Have I been fair to my health? I just recently started meds in like July. And so now I'm undetectable. So I am so super excited about that. It's like, I don't know, like I just ran through the finish line and I was the first one. We have so far to go to reach people, to break the stigma that surrounds HIV. When we stay quiet about it, it still remains an issue. And if we can address it and embrace it, then we don't have to be scared about it because we know exactly what we're dealing with. I've seen what HIV silent can do. And I saw how it just began to eat inside of him and who he was. And the man that I fell in love with wasn't the man that passed away. Mm -hmm. And that was just him keeping all of those feelings and that secret Mm -hmm. inside of him to where it just ate it it away. And I can't do that. I, I cannot okay. do that. I say that all the time. I have things to do. I'm not about that life. I'm not about that life. <laughs> That is empowered.org, or I'm sorry, greater than.org. And there's a whole bunch of videos there. Let me just get back to our slides. Oh, look at that. I don't even know how I did that. I don't even know how you did that either. <laughs> Um, all right, so this comes up. This is a really unique case. Um, this individual w- to protect their identity, we live in a small state, um, so we're gonna try and be gender neutral here. Um, they were diagnosed after years in a monogamous relationship. Um, so they found out their diagnosis of HIV and ended the relationship immediately. Um, they had multiple other chronic illnesses going on, which is how they were found out. Um, and then they, uh, they entered into a new relationship and did not want to disclose, um, their status. They were undetectable at the time. Um, and, uh, so I was brought into this case. Um, the nurse was a little bit incre- incredulous about it. Um, uh, it's like, don't they see the irony? Don't they see the problem here? And we, I talked with the nurse specifically, but also with the patient around, excuse me, 
that um, they have a right to mm -hmm. not disclose. Absolutely. And there might be a symmetry here, um, but it's not, it's not a perfect symmetry. Um, this patient actively takes their meds, actively takes care of their health. Their previous partner did not, unfortunately, um, in general. Um, and so it's a, it's a different kind of situation. Um, but I think that that brings up a lot of feelings. Um, isn't this person doing exactly what they didn't want in their other one? And they were, this person was so angry, so angry that the, that their previous partner had not disclosed. Mm -hmm. So embittered around it, um, unfortunately. So I don't know if you have anything. More to I know. Add. And see, for me, at first, when we discussed this um, case, I was super surprised that um, they didn't disclose. But again, I always have to go back and remind myself that how I react and what my values are, mm -hmm. are not what someone else's are. So once Erin and I talked about it, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I think that it was very empowering for them to know that they were on top of their health they were undetectable mm -hmm. and it was their choice not to disclose, but they weren't harming that other person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas in their situation, they weren't disclosed to with full knowledge mm -hmm. of being harmful mm -hmm. to them. So that's where I realized this. And I was like, wow, that's super empowering for this person. They don't have to disclose. Right. Um, yeah, so this this case is um, like they were diagnosed within the last five years, and um, and they were undetectable before they entered into their new relationship. Yeah. So th those are two things to think about. Um, mm -hmm. The their previous partner had been was a long term survivor and had been diagnosed for a long time, um, and again wasn't wasn't undetectable consistently. Um, didn't their their medical health was not their priority um so yeah yeah i think that that impacted it um let's, this is for your oh this is EJ me story <laughs> so full disclosure we're going to be talking yes. about sex we're going to talk about acts. sex <laughs> so in my um dating world um <clears throat> when i decided after my long-term relationship that for me to make me feel good and well, not make me feel good per se, but to make me feel good about myself and my values, I decided that anybody that I dated that would be a potential partner that I would have sex with, that I was going to disclose because that's how it was going to work for me. So I met someone and we'll call him BJ. We're going to call him BJ. Oh, that's a really great name. <laughs> um, you know, we got along great. We hit it off. We had dinner together. Um, you know, we did have uh, a couple of drinks and super comfortable together. And we started talking. You know, this was a gentleman that had said to me, you know, he was really interested in dating me, wanted a serious relationship. You know, and I decided, okay, well, this seems like it's leading somewhere. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him now, you know, before we go on 15 dates and then I end up having to tell him or, but that's for me, right? So I decided, you know what, this is it. I'll tell him I'm HIV positive. Um, you know, do you have any questions? Let's talk. And he just stopped me right there and said, you know what, I really like you. I like you so much, he said, but I could never date anybody. I could never have a relationship with anyone who's HIV positive. I just can't. That's just completely against all of my values. And I just absolutely can't do it. Totally against it. So sorry. You know, we could just be friends. And I said, well, you know what? That's okay. I respect that. You know, that's how you feel. And thanks. My own. You know, but fine. And then, he immediately followed that up with, 
but you know what, you know, while you're here, you know, while we're hanging out, while we're together, you know, you can give me a blowjob, right? Because nobody ever got HIV from a blowjob. And so yeah, so, you know, that for me was like an eye opener, you know, of the disclosing piece and like of people's values, you know, like I wasn't good enough to, I'm not good enough to date because I have HIV, but I can give you a blowjob. I can go down on you. I can fellatio, you know, I can go to town, right? That's okay. So, you know, that was a, a big thing for me. That was really, I was like, wow, that's, huge, you know, I'm, but for me, I was really glad that I, I disclosed because I learned something about him that I probably <laughs> so wouldn't have learned him. if I didn't, or I would have learned it eventually, I'm sure. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> that relationship, but yeah. <clears throat> will you share with us your share. thoughts about how, how we someone disclose. disclose after sex? So, you know, how do we disclose after we've had sex? You know, for me, I've shared my previous story of, you know, how do you disclose afterwards? And I really look at it this way. You know, you can always disclose. You know, um, we have written on this slide, like really, you know, it says it right there. You know, you may feel guilty or you're really afraid of what the other person might say or how they're going to react, but you can always disclose. It is never, ever too late to disclose. And you know, it could possibly bring you closer together. It really could. I mean, it may push you apart, but something that I've also learned, and for me, and I don't know how other people feel about this, I kind of look at things that if it's meant to be, it's meant to be kind of thing. It doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. It doesn't mean you're not going to feel bad or that other person might feel bad. But, you know, if, if you're just, if you decide that you're going to disclose and you've already had sex, then you know, you know that you're doing what makes you feel okay. It may not make the other person feel okay, but that's on them. Well, and I think kind sometimes of sex is, happens. Yeah, I mean, it happens, but I mean, you know, not that like, uh, we're not talking about um, rape here, uh, but no. just like that sometimes like you're with someone else and the moment seems right and things are going and then because none of us have had that happen before right <laughs> never never right and and so sometimes it have the disclosure happens after the fact mm -hmm. and that's where and i think this is actually on our next slide oh nope just kidding that's our lucy slide um where you can say like wait let's oh maybe we went maybe that slide was way uh, oh, wrong ago, but, <laughs> but you can say like wait let me get a condom or yeah uh, you know like there are things that you can say um if things are kind of moving in that direction um Absolutely. and that's that's um like you know, you know protecting your sexual health actually i think that that's oh, yeah. in the next cup like oh after i believe so i like, think you're right because so. and again as we always have on here you know if you're undetectable you are unable to transmit hiv right. so that's always a big thing especially if you're disclosing after the fact right that you know you can always have that discussion yeah. as well i i think that if you're undetectable it's going to be a crucial part of the conversation yeah. <laughs> um do you wanna... Oh, I can always touch this. Um, so how do you navigate people's reactions about disclosing? Something that I've experienced, um, you know, every time I disclosed, and this was either, I mean, it can go, it can be across the board. I've had this happen with potential partners, but also like really close friend that I disclose to. You never know how someone's going to react mm -hmm. when you disclose. And I've had people react that they were just distraught and they weren't upset with me but this particular person was so upset for me because I was positive and they I mean they just cried I mean I had um, a gentleman that you know uh, was a potential partner. We ended up living way too far away, so it didn't work out that way. But he was distraught. He was absolutely just so upset about this that I, he cried for days. Like we were on the phone for hours and hours, and he just couldn't wrap his mind around me being positive. And I don't know what happened in his life that was just, this was so traumatic for him. But it's one of those things that, you know, I've had time to 
um, to be one with my status. I couldn't even, I'm reading it, but I still couldn't get it <laughs> I know, out. but that's what you I always say too, out. which is so funny. I know, like, I'm just I one do. With it. <laughs> I'm one with it, and I am, but I realize that it takes people time to wrap their brains around your status. And it may take people time, it may take other people, like my current partner that I've been with for three years, for him, I told him, and he was like, okay, that's, that's okay. You know, I'm glad you told me. I'm glad you were honest. I'm glad. Um, but again, you don't know how to navigate how someone will react. And I've always right. used it also as a conversation that, you know, it not only brings up me and my status, but it gives me that opportunity if it's a potential partner to talk about them and their status mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, about testing slide. and whatnot. Look Bam, that, next girl. slide. But um Should've also been more on it, sorry. Oh no, you're fine. I forgot. <laughs> um but also like even if it was a friend, I've told a friend after I knew her for maybe six or seven years. And she at first she was upset with me. Not upset because I had HIV, but she was kind of hurt because she thought that I didn't um that I wasn't comfortable enough with her to tell her. And, you know, it wasn't a bad conversation. We had a really great conversation about it. But, um, you know, I realized that, you know, you don't know how people react. Well, and one of the things that I'm hearing you talk about um, is that those two people, right? The guy yeah. who cried and cried and the friend who got mad at you, they're making it about them. Oh, yes. No, you're right. Just and their no, perspective. Yes. And that's huge because you are totally right about that, especially for example. Um, yeah, no, that makes total sense. And I didn't think about it because it is, it's, and it wasn't about them. It was about me. And yeah, no, yeah. because sometimes I used to feel like I had to relive it, right. relive my diagnosis when I disclosed to people, which now this many years later, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't need to relive right. my initial diagnosis. Right. Because me being positive just has turned into part of me. And I don't know if it's that for everyone. She's one. I'm one with it. <laughs> <laughs> one with it. But you know, then we go into our role though, like yeah. when we're sharing our status with people, because you know, we want to be able to take care of our sexual health, right? Way and to bring it back to the presentation. Good Thank job. You. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> here are some things you could say, like if things are um, getting heated between someone, do you have protection? <clears throat> I have protection, let's use it. Wait, let me get a condom, right? Um, and and before or after, hey, let's talk about status. Mm -hmm. um, that, that that those things are okay. Um, it's funny. So it says the the penicillin shots. Um, Julie didn't know this, but because I'm in the clinic. When, oh yeah. With um when we're having well, I used to be now with COVID. I'm not, but um we we have certain days of clinic days, and I'm I'm often there to you know if mental health <laughs> is needed urgently, and um you know, we, disclosing doesn't just have to be about, oh, now I have to tell this big thing that I've got weighing on me, but it's also about finding out, you know, what's going on with the other people, and I told her, I told Julie, I was like, because those syphilis shots are so nasty, and she's like, what are you talking about, or not syphilis shots, penicillin shots for syphilis, oh, and yeah. I was telling her how, like, I don't know how many of you guys are nurses or not, um, but, like, they're just like these huge shots that are no like idea. painful to get and you get them in your bum and it's just like this terrible experience uh, that resulted in like a needle phobia for um, someone that I work with. And um, so yeah, not a fun time, protect yourself. And exactly. we actually have a, an amazing video about that as well. When I got in infected, I put my trust in someone who took off the condom while we were having sex. Had knowledge that he took off the condom, but I didn't say anything. I didn't speak up. I wasn't educated at all about HIV. The first thought that came to mind was death. Just tell me when, just tell me when I'm gonna die. Especially being young, 19, about to turn 20 years old, it was, it was rough. Thinking about nobody wants you. It was just like this whole new life I had to start living. And how am I gonna live it? Who do I wanna tell my status to? Who can I trust? I did not wanna start treatment. I didn't wanna to have to depend on pills for the rest of my life. But my grandmother, she talked me into it and she told me, if you have to be put on meds, just go ahead and do it. 
And I'm glad I did because I probably wouldn't be sitting here. It's my lifeline and I choose to live, so I do take my treatment. What made me start fighting back was me noticing the silence. No one was talking about it. HIV has been out for 30 plus years and no one is saying anything. And that's just, that was just my deciding moment right there. I just, let me speak up. That's my passion is to go out and share my experience and just educate. Letting people know I'm still human and just being a voice for others that can't speak up or too afraid to speak up. Sympathy needs to be taken out of HIV. We need to start getting mad about it and start getting to the point where we want to do something. My first advice for young people is to love yourself. Protect yourself. Look out for yourself because nobody else is going to. And that leads into not putting your trust all into one person. And that's what happened to me. Don't be afraid to speak your mind. You are your own advocate and your own activist, whatever it is you're going through. Don't ever get discouraged if you do yell and I will seek. Breaking the silence in unity, the world will listen when we speak. <laughs>
feel like it's the end. <laughs> so, and hey, we're not terribly bad on time either. Um, so this is our contact information. Um, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, we're gonna try and be live for the presentation mm -hmm. so that we can engage in conversations in the chat. So if you have questions for us, or if you have a question, you don't feel comfortable putting it in the chat, you can Always definitely, it, yeah. yep, exactly. So um, thank you for being here with us on our presentation and hopefully you learned something um, about uh, dating, disclosure, and discrimination for people with MSHA. Thank you.